So the next speaker in the, in the session uh, is Peria Radeva. She's uh, at the University of Barcelona, and um, she's working in image processing. Um, um, she had the PhD degree from the University Autonoma, Universidad Autónoma de Barcelona, and currently she's head of the Barcelona Perceptual Computing Laboratory at the University of Barcelona, and also the head of the Medical Imaging Laboratory, MILAP, uh, of um, Computer Vision Center. Uh, so her present uh, interests in research uh, are on development of learning-based approaches for computer vision and, uh, and the image processing. So, and, and, and she applies uh, all these um, machine learning techniques for vision in a variety of different projects um, involving um, wearable uh, cameras, um, health issues, health detection, um, um, and so on. So it's, it's, a, it's a large variety of things. So without further ado, I will let this, uh, um, Petya to take the stage. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe it's too loud. Too, too, too loud, too loud. So first of all, I would like to say thank you to the organizers for the nice opportunity to stay here to explain our research and to interact in, uh, with you. Um, uh, the title of the speech today is about the certainty aware analysis by deep learning. Especially this is deep learning today is uh, like revolutionizing computer vision. Not, not only computer vision, but computer vision is what, where I am interested. So I just want to show you some like 10 years ago. to get to the opposite side where we believe so we you see maybe 10 to 15 years ago the movie avatar one of my favorite movie um, used its computer vision in order to create this uh, these characters and this was the only way to to achieve this kind of realistic representation was trying to capture by computer vision the motion of the of the persons and then in, in integrate it in the virtual characters so things changed quite a lot from this time even though, though the actors are moving all around, running, jumping, you, you know, see, at this time, jumping off stuff, jumping they, over logs, people, actors you know, had to, to out, have a lot of different uh, devices in order to be captured that, uh, to in, the, in a very robust way. From the actor's lips. Today, we, a lot of you have played already with trying to change our uh, hairdress, or even we know that today we have uh, automatic driving cars, like here, for example, here. This is not your normal. It's not just a straight okay, So my hands are off the steering wheel. This is Adam, Tesla. Sure hands are off. Well, my hands are up in the air for okay. some reason. Okay, <laughs> all right, and we are turning. doing it. It is, it's doing it. A lot doing of advantages, really well a lot yeah, of ad I get to look at this view advances in driving. automatic driving. Tesla's a pro at staying in one lane, but we wanted to find out if it Today we also have uh, our system that are helping us to go very fast through the passport control. A lot of you cross it uh, different uh, frontiers in order to come to here. So today we use computer vision in order to capture Face and, just gonna walk up and, and recognize faces. Wow, yeah. It amazes me. Every year things yeah. changed. It just amazes me, the technology. Today we have very nice also systems for virtual dressing. Amazon Go is the latest effort by Amazon. Just Oops. Show me skirts. Show me 
blue. In seconds, facial recognition technology. And also, I like very much this video of Amazon. Amazon didn't go into a lot of detail how they do this, but it's basically Just following the sensors <laughs> that are in the shelves. This they is also about have automatic shopping. Of cameras hanging on the ceiling. It basically just like tracks you in the store and so it your is working, link right? to that account. Yeah, it's, I didn't it's have true. to interact with anybody. <laughs> People just get the, the products the and put in it their boxes as fast and as then I they go out. out. And then I was out and computer there. vision it's systems are your Amazon able to the Amazon track them to know if so they return it back because they the change their mind. And see your receipt. So the whole point of this they is just to go make out. it very fast no, and convenient for cues, you. No, cues, not Amazon goes been in beta for the past year with employees able to visit. Okay, so computer vision is here. Computer vision is not only in our scientific papers, computer vision is also in our life. And it is getting more and more, we are, we are getting more and more used to that. So this is another, another system that is at this moment implementing in Europe. And it is uh, about uh, also helping uh, the, the passport control, so in this case face recognition and VINs inspection and uh, also print are put together in order to help these 700 millions of people that are crossing during the year uh, frontiers in Europe. So this system is also integrating in this moment. So computer vision uh, is about this, it's about understanding images, understanding pictures, trying to ask questions and to answer to them. What is in the scene and where are the cars and how many and what is strange and is there any danger, etc., etc. Today, computer vision ch changes a lot, a lot. And this is one of the reasons for this is uh, the deep learning technology. So we cannot uh, uh, go forward much further if we don't say anything about deep learning. Deep learning today is allowing to track all Chinese people. So there, is, there was a publication about this system that in, in China today there are some about 170 millions of cameras installed all over the roads. And the purpose of this system is to track people and to um, analyze what happened on the street. <laughs> 176 million cameras. And in three years, they, in two years, they claim to double oh, it. I was like, this is just a, really a lot of information, mm -hmm. but apparently a lot of data. And there, the, the question is, what computer vision machine learning can help in order to really get this benefit for the society? Just two more examples. This is very nice, also a video showing, due to deep learning, how people from Berkeley are able to capture motion and then reproduce it in an artificial actor. So you see, this is the source and this is the virtual dancer. How realistic it is. We're entering and also an era a lot of you our maybe enemies not. can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time. Today, deep learning also say those allows to so, create even for instance, they could have me news. say things like So this is what know, Obama never said. Killmonger was right. But it was just or created a Ben Carson is in the sunken place. Or how about this? Simply President Trump is a total and complete dipshit. Now, you see, I would never say these things, at least not in a public address, but someone else would. Someone like Jordan Peele. 
This is a dangerous time. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the Internet. That's a time when we need to rely on trusted news sources. So there, is, there are very nice talks uh, about ethics in artificial intelligence. I wouldn't go <laughs> in this direction. The purpose of the, uh, of the talk is different. The, the purpose is how to get benefit of this very challenging deep technology and uh, deep learning technology in order to help to solve really challenging problems. And deep learning technology today is, sorry, uh, today is changing uh, the different fields of science, like uh, discovering drugs, like uh, security and defense and autonomous driving, etc. Uh, in our case, uh, we will apply it on different problems, on foot image analysis. And uh, we decided to use it because convolutional neural networks today have been shown to be better than human beings in many, many fields, like object recognition, lip reading, high-end surveillance, facial recognition, object-based searches, license plate readers, trapping violation detection, breast thermosynthesis diagnosis, etc., etc. So we have really a very powerful technology, and we need to use it in order to solve really challenging problems. Okay, so the challenging problem for us is the foot image analysis, as we will uh, I will talk. Uh, and it is uh, use it, it, is, it will be solved in a supervised learning uh, uh, framework. So in the supervised learning framework, what we have is a lot of data. So we have some input data and ground truth. We decide what feature extraction could be, or we let the algorithm to decide what would be the feature extraction. So we did this feature space. We need to create this core function in order to predict our label. This core function, we will have some parameters. In order to measure this core function, we need to measure the error of this core function. So that's why we need to create this loss function that is measuring the difference between predicted uh, labels and ground truth. So the problem in supervised learning is how to learn the best, the optimal F score function, so that the minimum error or the loss function is minimal. And while well, this is a very well-known uh, structure of uh, neural networks, neural networks are based on layers of neurons. The, the new things compared to 30, 40 years ago is that in this case, in today, convolutional neural networks, for example, they have different operators that are uh, implemented due to, through the different layers. So we have convolution implemented, we can have uh, like max pooling, we can have uh, a ReLU uh, function, etc., etc., and then just on the end we have fully connected layers. So each neuron is connected to each one. The purpose, the, the, the problem of training the, this uh, model the problem of training the final fu the function that is represented by this model is translated to how to determine all these parameters and all these parameters. So usually you can see if we have here 4,000 4, by 4,000, we have like here 16 million of parameters that are uh, connecting different neurons. And then we can have another, uh, another and another and another. So, uh, well, <laughs> Okay, so, so basically the, the problem is how to train these parameters in which way in order to get optimal uh, performance. So in order to train these algorithms, so in order to uh, find these parameters, usually what we do is we apply a backpropagation uh, uh, algorithm. So we uh, need to apply the like gradient descent, uh, stochastic gradient descent, or, or some alternatives in order to uh, see, to measure, and, and to try to minimize the loss function with respect to these parameters. So usually we use the softmax function in order to, 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 find, to get the final score and the loss function is usually the negative logarithm. Okay, um, the point is that in this new framework of uh, convolutional neural networks that is, that is in deep learning, in fact, framework, in fact, we should be very aware that we change the paradigm of our computer science projects. Uh, in fact, 
usually in a computer science project what we have is we have the, the problem, we make the user requirements, we define the model, we define the features and then we test on data and then we try to improve and then we get the final results. In this case, in the deep learning, we are changing this, this uh, paradigm. And for us, it is what kind of data we have, can we, how to prepare this data, what can we do with this data, how to define a model, how to train the model, how to improve the data, how to improve the model, etc., etc., etc. So it is, we should be very, very aware that the paradigm is different. Yeah, in, compu in this, in this <coughs> computer science problems. And there is no clear view on how insight is generated. That's why, as we, as uh, it was mentioned in the previous talks, if, for example, explainability is a very, very important question. We don't want that the neural networks are black boxes. We want that they explain why they decide, why they take decision. In fact, there is a very big question if neural networks can be used in, to, in order to process medical images. Because if they get the wrong decision, if they, they cannot explain why this decision is done, so they can really have a very, very uh, big problems uh, used it in, 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 in health. And of course, also this system is only good as much as the data are good. So we should be very aware of this different situation. Okay, in our case, we decided to apply it for the foot image analysis. And why is the foot recognition a challenge? Because if you see the foot, it is not very easy even for human to decide. So if I ask you, what is this? How many seconds do you need to answer? And if we ask what is this and what is this and what is this, so you see a lot, a lot of variations. Okay, basically this can be summarized in, we have very huge interclass variants. For example, all this is apple pie, but you see that this is looking very different from this, from this and from this. We have very ambiguous definitions. So is this a dessert, apple pie, or, te or cake with apples, or, or something else? Yeah, or Bavarian apple, uh, Bavarian cake. We have inter-class inter similarity. For example, all these could be different meats, and they can look very, very similar. We have a lot of mixed items, usually. We need a huge data set. And uh, most of the data sets that today are public, they are bad labeled, so you have some, uh, some uh, uh, errors there. Okay, so now the question is, uh, how much data, what kind of data we have in order to decide what we can do? Uh, and we see that if you have a look perspectively, retrospectively, and you see, for example, the data set that have been used previously. So in most of the public data set, we had some about up to 250 uh, objects to recognize in the object recognition problems. A big change was when ImageNet appeared because we had for the first time 1,000 of different classes to recognize. But even if we go to the data set, you see that in the previous public data set, so we had in total like 3,000 or 160 uh, images in order to train our object recognition uh, models. So it, is, it seems like a toy problem now, now today, right? And then there was a big change when ImageNet appeared. So it, it appeared with 1,400,000 labeled images. So it is like, like one order of difference with respect to brief before. So now we can really think about having some real model that can solve real problems. And that's why, for example, the object recognition for some people is considered a solved problem. Now, for the food database, the question is, what food database should, have, should we have? At this moment, we have about 150,000 images public and 230, 230 categories approximately. Uh, if we compare to ImageNet, we have one order bigger and one order more categories. But according to Wikipedia, today we have 200,000 basic food categories. 
So, how much images do we need in order to recognize 200,000 categories? If we do some, some very simple extrapolation, so you can see that, for example, if we use this, that for full database we have 230 image, that is 1,000, and in Wikipedia, say, 200,000, so it means that we need 280 million of images in order to recognize 200,000 categories. Yeah, so this is re really a, an interesting problem. Okay, so uh, are we used, are we prepared to train with 280,000 images? And even more, who will label 280,000, uh, 280 million of images? Who will label it? How much time do we need for this? This is a really uh, interesting question. And even more, uh, we don't have only images. We have text, a lot of text in the internet, right? We have Yambly, we have Fedamam, we have a lot of uh, repos repositories where we have re recipes, we have ingredients, we have instructions, we have video instructions, how to cook, etc., etc. How to put together all this information? and to take profit of this, uh, an interesting question. And this is also what industry is and demanding because there is a very growing interest in products that are analyzing food information in, in, in internet and elsewhere. Okay, so what methodology to use in order to deal with reasonable amount of data? This is a big question. Probably speaking about this difficult question, one is for sure that we will need deep learning. And but, however, uh, we need to, if we use uh, convolutional neural networks in order to analyze images, uh, we will need um, uh, a lot of data. So, well, probably data is not so big problem because only the last two years we created more than all, all that was created as digital information before. But who will annotate this? This is a real question. And how can we use the benefit of deep learning in order to help to the problem? Can we use information from one domain to help to other domain? That is, can, how to apply the knowledge transfer, et cetera, et cetera. So, a lot of interesting uh, sub-problems in, in um, deep learning are, in, uh, are defined, especially how to do transfer learning. And what we are really interested in is in basically two kind of transfer learning. One is what is related like multitask learning. In this case is um, how to put together different problems in order to help each other and this is what we will discuss. But also uh, we are very interested also in domain adaptation, how to use information from one domain in order to help to the other one. Okay, so try to, let's imagine this architecture. Uh, if we have a normal CNN, so in normal CNN we have the images as input, then we have some layers, and then we have last uh, layer that has as much neurons as categories we want to recognize. When we speak about multitask learning, in this case we are speaking about how to put different models together, that is how to solve different problems together. And this makes a lot of sense because if I have these images, I can make different questions like what is the dish, what are the ingredients, what, are the, what is the food group, if it is dessert, if it is, a, if it is soup, if it is a vegetable, uh, what is the cuisine, if it is French cuisine, it is, a, a, it is Japanese cuisine, etc., etc. So all these are different problems. They have different answers, okay? So I can have different models but because the, these different questions are related, so I, it makes sense to put together and to have one model that is, asking, that is answering different questions. So that's why I can create my model that is multitask model so that it is split in somewhere and, and at the end we have different, uh, different uh, layers that are answering to the different questions. But how to combine different tasks? This is, this is question, uh, a que an open question. On the other hand also, because we uh, mentioned that we have images and also text, so it makes sense to make a multi-model pro uh, model, multi -model models. 
Um, so, if we can define some, some model that has images as input and then text as other input and then we combine them in order to get better uh, final result. And even we can have cross-model CNNs when we can use only text information in order to improve our model so that at the end our model will, should be able to, to answer to the question only using images. Yeah, so in this case, I'm using text, text information in order just to improve, but I don't ask that text is at the end in my, in my final input. Uh, okay, we are working on different uh, sub-problems. So our world is composed by food recognition, food retrieval, food segmentation. Today, I want to explain you how we approach the food recognition, food recognition in a multitask learning framework because we are interested to answer to different uh, recognition tasks like what is the cuisine, categories, ingredients, and dish. So, we decided to use the multitask learning basically because different uh, problem, uh, questions are correlated. So we have on the same domain, on the same images, we can ask these different questions, but definitely one task can help to the other one. And also because multitask learning models, are, in fact, we are uh, uh, training one model instead of three. So in this case, also, it is more efficient and more, more precise. And it, 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 it has less parameters. And in this way, we can do this inductive knowledge transfer to generalize by sharing the domain information between complementary tasks. Okay, so let's think about, we have our model. So our model at the end has different, last uh, four different uh, uh, layers that uh, using softmax are answering to the question. So the question is how to train this model. So what is the loss of this? Uh, model that is answering, that is solving four different tasks. Each of the tasks has its error, right? So the most intuitive way is to combine the loss of, the, my, of my multitask model as a sum of the losses of the different tasks, right? Now, if we use this, uh, shall we uh, use some weights? or not. If we don't use any weight or if we just use the average, in this case each task is influencing to the same, in the same way to the other one. But we can think is that some of the tasks will be much more precise, some of the tasks like for example food cuisine could probably is easier, so it will be much more precise, and other tasks like ingredients recognition would have much more errors, so maybe also it is also uh, introducing noise to the other one in the model. Okay, so it makes sense that these weights, in fact, reflect the noise of the, each of the tasks. And that's why uh, we decided to use the uncertainty modeling uh, techniques in order to, uh, to define this, this weight. So, speaking about uncertainty, we can think about different kinds of uncertainty that has been defined by people working on statistic modeling. In fact, people, uh, statistics, uh, statistics they speak about epistemic and aleatoric noise or epistemic and aleatoric uncertainty. What are they? Uh, an epistemic uncertainty, this is all this noise that is coming or all this uncertainty that is coming of our model. So if we think that our data are in a very complicated manifold and we try to separate with a hyperplane, linear hyperplane, we will never solve the problem. Right? So this is problem of the model. And then we have aleatoric uh, uncertainty that is coming from the noise of the data because we never will have all the possible data of the world for our, for our problem. So we always we have some uncertainty that is uh, uh, associated with the finite, finite number of data and data with their noise. So in this case, we speak about aleatoric noise. And if this aleatoric noise is data dependent, depending on the values, it, is, it can be bigger or smaller. In this case, we speak about heterostatic uncertainty. But if it doesn't depend on the data, but depends on the task, as, in, as it is in our case, in this case, we speak about homostatic uncertainty. Okay? 
So, uh, there are some nice uh, literature, uh, some nice models in the Bloom literature that are representing the probabilities of, the, the, uh, of a multitask model where we have t task here is represented by a Gaussian distributions where in fact sigma of this Gaussian distribution, distribution is a model observation noise parameter. Okay? So our parameters should be, uh, are directly related to this sigma parameter that is reflecting the noise uh, of the model observation. Okay, so in our case, going, trying to go short, uh, we, what we can do is we can express the loss function of the multitask model with all the different noises of the different tasks as uh, this very nice expression where we have the loss functions of each of the tasks and they are uh, here weighted by the sigma that is the parameter noise. The noise parameter. Okay, so it has been using this for regression and single label classification. We uh, extended this for multi label classification. In multi label classification, we don't have only one answer, we have several answers, like ingredients recognition. So in this case, we have the expression for the loss function, and then we can substitute this in order to uh, uh, compute the loss function of the whole model. So the algorithm is train the model, check if the loss converged, update the noise estimation, sigma for the different task, estimate the loss the, of the model, and then again, that, uh, until it converges. Okay, now in our case, uh, what we, uh, how di did we apply this? We constructed our multitask foot date Im uh, image net. And this is composed by 65 ingredients, four, four, 450 dishes, 10, 40 <coughs> drinks, and, uh, and uh, here we have uh, 10 cuisines. So we got from Yamli a lot of ingredients, a lot of uh, recipes, and uh, this, uh, and, and we applied the model. So uh, in our case, what we have is here some results. Uh, this is for the recognition of the dish, cuisine, fa the family group and ingredients. And you can see that for the ResNet, that is the best result by single task model, we have these results, but for the, for the uncertainty-based multitask, we have these results, so it improved. And we also put, introduce it a new measurement so that we ask that our model, when it is good, we want that it is good in all the tasks. If it is bad, if could be in as many as possible because usually from acceptance point of view when you want to see a result we, you want that our model is good in all the different questions so once you see an error you say okay model is not good so this is uh, precision is multitask accuracy so we see that our model in this more restrictive uh, measurement is is better Okay, some results here, for example, you see for the ingredients, that is one of the most difficult uh, tasks, how do we recognize the ingredients? So red is error, green is good, so you see the prediction and the ground truth, and the prediction the ground truth, so in many of the cases uh, we are quite good. Then also it is interesting to see when the model works, how if it is work in a reasonable way, that is how to explain or at least to illustrate the results. So we go back and we, we see what are the part of the images the, the model focuses in order to answer to the questions. So you can uh, go back and see if it is really focusing on the, uh, on the image, uh, on the part of the image that is used for the food. If you are curious, if you want to have a look, you can go to logmill.s and then you can have some demo, you can test, there are 100,000 images where you can play or even if you, you can put your image and then try to see how it works. It works for the European uh, dishes, <laughs> not for any <laughs> European and international dishes. And this, at this moment, there, is, there are 550 all different categories from which 60 ingredients, 60 uh, drinks, and all the rest is, is food. Okay, a lot of application. We are working, we are collaborating with different companies and institutions on different application problems. Like, for example, we consider that such 
food recognition is very important for dietitians in order to help their clients in order to visualize what really their clients uh, uh, eat. There are some uh, li literatures that say that there are up to 35% of what people think they eat and what they really eat. So having objective uh, tools in order to store and process and see what people eat is very important for dietitian and hospitals insurance companies. We are also in contact with some companies for working on these calorie counters and foodie societies. Also with can big company for food recommender and also we are um, doing our, we are uh, collaborating with a company for automatic catering for self-service uh, uh, restaurants. And last, uh, in fact, we are interested in what people eat, that is, we are interested in developing tools in order to help people to know what eat people eat, but also we are working on the wearable cameras in with which we are uh, also getting information of how people eat, in which context, in when, how long, uh, in which situations. And this is very interesting uh, from scientific and uh, health point of view. Conclusions, what I would say is that computer vision is part of our daily life and deep learning came to stay and probably most of you are convinced on this. Food image world brings us huge amount of data and computer vision question that still we need to define data sets, problems, questions and answers and then to define the robust methodologies and technology. A huge impact is expected up to my opinion from scientific point of view but also from real world application especially important for the society. So we are in a very good moment now because uh, we have a lot of uh, that is a rush with companies and, uh, and academy. This is a very nice uh, moment to, to take into account but also is very dynamic and this is probably uh, you, most of you are convinced. Thank you very much for your uh, attention. Okay, thank you very much.